to discuss what could be uh, the statement and the action that the European Union and its member states may take after an Israeli decision to go ahead with annexation. We have convened politicians and experts from both Israel and Europe to have different viewpoints on whether the European Union will move from statement to actions, and if so, how will that look like? Uh, we will have a series of interventions, seven minutes each, and I would like to ask the speakers to stay within the time frame of seven minutes in order to enable us also a discussion as much as possible. After each round of interventions, we will open the floor for some questions, and I apologize, we will not be able to take all questions because our time is limited and the number of participants is significant. Uh, you are on mute, but you can release yourself when you want to, to intervene. If we encounter any technical difficulties, which I hope we will not, we may ask to close cameras to improve the connections. Uh, the event is recorded, so anything we say here is on record. Okay, so I want you to know uh, uh, this issue. Uh, I want to thank the Friedrich Ebert Foundation for this uh, partnership, and Maya and the ICI, uh, to Naima Barak, to Merat Etan uh, who helped make it uh, happen. Uh, we do have a slight change of order in our speakers, and we'll begin with a member of uh, the Deutsche Bundestag, Dr. Neil Schmidt, uh, who is a German politician of the SPD, the Social Democratic Party. He has been a member of the Bundestag since 2017. He serves on the Committee on Foreign Affairs, where he is the parliamentary group spokesman. Dr. Smith, we would like to thank you for being here with us and giving us this Yeah, thank you, Nimrod, and uh, big thanks to all the organizers of this uh, web event. I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, discussion. Uh, since we've been debating in Berlin about the annexation plans of the Israeli government for some time. And we've been in close contact with uh, representatives uh, from Israel and especially through the aid of uh, Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Israel and in Palestine, we've been able to have uh, some insightful debates. Um, and this, is very, this has been very important uh, for us, um, because um, German Parliament is going to have a parliamentary debate uh, tomorrow afternoon at 4:30 uh, 4:30 uh, p.m. local time um, on these annexation plans. Um, it's uh, uh, not really necessary to. Um, remind you that we as friends of Israel in Germany, we are very concerned about uh, the annexation plans. Um, Heiko Maas, our foreign minister, traveled to the region and made that very clear. And uh, there's no doubt that uh, this annexation would be a clear breach of international law and that it would more or less lead to an end of any attempt at um, realizing the two-state solution, which has been um, a general consensus among the international community for so many years, and of course has also been consensus of the European Union and of German uh, foreign policy for, for many years. And um, I would like to point out that even discussing this issue in security terms, it seems to us, to many Germans, that the overwhelming majority of the security establishment in Israel is opposed to that idea because it will not enhance Israel, Israel's uh, security, but rather deteriorate it uh, because of its uh, damaging effects on regional stability, especially. Uh, on the stability of Jordan, which is partner of Israel within the framework of a peace treaty, and there are not so many peace treaties Israel has uh, concluded with uh, its um, Arab neighbors in the last uh, 40 to 50 years. So um, Jordan's role will be pivotal in maintaining uh, regional stability and in maintaining peace uh, in the area. Um, what we are 
proposing as the ruling coalition here in Germany is to uh, is issue a statement to vote a resolution in the German Bundestag on the annexation plans. And uh, we've been preparing that for um, several weeks now. And uh, the text, uh, which will be submit, submitted uh, tomorrow in the afternoon to the German Bundestag, and which is supported not only uh, by the Christian Democrats and the Social Democrats as the uh, ruling parties in, in Parliament, but also by the liberals, um, clearly states that uh, annexation would be uh, a breach and in contradiction to international law. And it encourages, once again, dialogue um, uh, taking as a starting point the uh, relevant resol UN resolutions of the last uh, decades. And uh, so what we would like to issue is a sort of warning uh, to our friends in Israel that annexation is a really bad idea and will not have the support of uh, of Germany uh, and of course not of the European Union. And uh, even, uh, even um, the Green Party was close to supporting this uh, resolution then for internal reasons they uh, will not go for it. But you can be assured that there the big majority of political parties, what I would call the political mainstream parties, from the left, uh, the Green Party, Social Democrats, to the right, um, Liberal Conservative right, uh, Liberal Party, and Christian Democratic Party, um, is opposing the idea of annexation. And uh, we want to help to prevent the Israeli government uh, uh, from uh, taking this very, very negative uh, step. And um, so the idea of having a warning, of, uh, of putting up a sort of stop sign is behind this resolution. We do not, really, we do not uh, discuss consequences. This will be an issue to be debated within the EU framework after a possible uh, annexation. But for the time being, we focus on preventing annexation. And uh, let me made it, make it very clear that any kind of annexation, even a so-called small solution, uh, just uh, um, annexing some parts of the uh, settlement blocks uh, uh, close to Jerusalem, would be regarded as a breach of international law and would also uh, be uh, criticized and opposed by, by us in Germany. By the way, the German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas will uh, is going is planning to take part in this debate. So there will be a high political leverage behind this uh, resolution. And so, for us, uh, there is no doubt uh, that um, uh, the Israeli government uh, is on the wrong track um, if it pursues uh, the goal of. Uh, annexation of um, we want to have a negotiated settlement of the Israel-Palestine conflict and this can only uh, be reached by having a diplomatic effort uh, behind that and so uh, this is what uh, the state of affairs is here in, in Berlin right now and I'm now uh, keen to learn more uh, on your views, and uh, um, I'm ready to to have um, to take any questions and comments from your side. Uh, once again, thank you for inviting. Me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schmidt, for sharing these insights. I'm aware that my audio is not the best it could be, but I will try to improve it as our event continues. Uh, I will now turn to Dr. Nathalie Tocci in, in Italy. Uh, Dr. Nathalie Tocci is the director of the Inti Italian International <laughs> Affairs Institute, IAI. She is a special advisor to EU, High Representative Joseph Borrell, honorary professor at the University of Tübingen, and her research interests include European foreign policy, the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and conflict resolution. Uh, Nathalie, thank you for joining us. 
Thank you, thank you, Nimrod, and uh, a pleasure being with, uh, with with all of you today. A pleasure listening to Niels uh, just now. Uh, let me, um, given that you did mention my role as special advisor to the HRVP, clarify that what I'm about to say, I am saying entirely 100% and a little bit more in uh, in personal capacity. So. We're obviously still uh, in a phase in which um, we, as Europeans, uh, and, and, and Niels was very clear in this respect, uh, would like to imagine a world in which annexation can be prevented. Uh, so we're still very much hoping that this is an outcome that can be prevented. Uh, but I think deep down, uh, we probably know that there is little that we can do as Europeans to prevent things from going the way they would have otherwise uh, done. Uh, which is why we are engaging in a, not only thought process, uh, but a political process in reflecting about consequences. Now it's clear that the debate about consequences is done because it also has a signaling effect and that signaling effect uh, can uh, be dissuasive. Um, but in all honesty, I don't think that we have the uh, illusion in thinking that um, this is the only reason why we're doing it. We're doing it really because we are thinking about what are the possible consequences of a move that, as Niels was highlighting, we consider to be uh, a very destructive uh, move. Um, and in thinking through what these consequences can be, uh, I think it might be useful to sort of separate uh, three possible fields, which is basically the economic, the political, and the legal. Uh, now, obviously, many of these things are interrelated with one another, but I think both for analytical as well as for political reasons, it's actually uh, useful and important to, to separate them. Uh, and, and of course, this also falls into the reflection process, which is ongoing about the, the, the so-called options paper, uh, which, is being, uh, which is being worked on. Um, so beginning with the with the economic, I mean, here, obviously, the most obvious consequences are restrictive measures. I mean, this is normally uh, what is done uh, in reaction uh, to a blatant violation of international law, such as annexation. Uh, incidentally, it is something which is done uh, not only in uh, sort of unimportant and, and far removed places, it is something which has been done vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, countries which are extremely important uh, and where uh, the EU has very deep uh, strategic interests. Here, obviously, I'm uh, mainly thinking about Russia, and, and I, I highlight this point because often not only the academic, but the political, in a sense, criticism, which is uh, uh, sort of uh, done, is that of saying, well, you know, it's all very well and good, you know, the EU does sanctions when uh, basically uh, the, the country in question is not particularly relevant, is not particularly important, it doesn't really impinge upon uh, the EU strategic interests. Uh, well, Russia does, and, and, and sanctions and restrictive measures were, were taken in response to the annexation of, of Crimea. And therefore, although if we sort of apply the situation uh, for Israel, uh, I am not entirely sure uh, that it would go in the same direction. Um, but a, a often a case, uh, it, it really depends on how an action is undertaken, what are the immediate repercussions that it leads to. Again, if you take the, uh, the example uh, of, of Russia and the annexation of Crimea, uh, the penny really dropped after the downing of, uh, of MH17. Uh, so at times it is, you know, events, dear boy, events, you know, uh, and therefore something which as of today, you know, 30th of June, you know, in all honesty, I would say, well, I don't think it's particularly likely, even in the event of annexation, uh, I think it is important not to rule it out because of the way in which uh, annexation could actually play out and the implications that it, that it could lead to. A, a final reflection on, on the question of, of sanctions uh, is, is a, a reflection really about the effectiveness of sanctions, you know. Um, you know, the, the, again, a criticism that is at times made, as we know, sanctions are, are rarely effective, if probably never effective, in reversing a particular course. 
uh, which I think, you know, can be a fair criticism, but of course it also raises the counterfactual. What would happen if those sanctions were not in place? You know, how would Russia, again, to use the same example, how would Russia have behaved? Uh, how much further would it have gone uh, in the event that restrictive measures were not taken? And this inevitably has to be part uh, of, the, of the calculus, of the political calculus in proceeding in, in this direction. A second set of consequences, which are far, uh, in a sense, I would say less meaningful, uh, but, but, but definitely easier in many respects, are, are political consequences. And again, political consequences have financial, uh, obviously, implications too. I'd say the easiest of all, uh, but probably the less uh, meaningful of all, uh, would be uh, the recognition of Palestine uh, as, as a political act. Uh, I think this may well be a temptation, and I use the word temptation, uh, that uh, the EU, uh, and, and it's not the EU, it's member states that recognize states, but um, that member states may fall into because of the felt need to do something, but frankly speaking, something which is by and large, I would say, completely inconsequential. Uh, but, but, but again, I raise it as, as, as a possible route uh, which, um, uh, which may be taken. Far more consequential uh, would be a different political move, uh, which is one which basically says, well, uh, we um, stop uh, all our financial assistance to the Palestinian Authority. If the name of the game is no longer a two-state solution, I mean, we believed in it. Uh, we thought it was a great idea. We invested quite a bit of money into it. Uh, but um, if the direction of travel is a different one, which uh, is not as two-state one, is a one-state one, and obviously the only way for Europeans to conceive of a one-state uh, solution is, is clearly a democratic uh, one. But either way, we didn't want the solution, but, but facts uh, you know, uh, speak for themselves, and therefore there's little point in keeping on pouring money uh, into an authority which is obviously not going to become a state worthy of the name, which of course does not mean that uh, money would stop flowing to Palestinians, but not to Palestinian, if you like, quasi-state structures. So that would be a different, uh, and in a sense, a more meaningful uh, political reaction, obviously with financial implications uh, to, to annexation. Uh, the third and final uh, box, if you like, uh, is a box which I think is important, uh, both for analytical and perhaps even more so for political reasons to separate uh, from the previous two points that I discussed, are legal consequences. Uh, now, very clearly, uh, a move uh, like annexation would revamp what is known as the differentiation agenda. Uh, this is something that does not, uh, is not born with annexation, uh, but it is born with occupation. Uh, but very clearly, annexation would put a sort of renewed premium on the differenti differentiation agenda, uh, meaning the fact that the EU uh, treats uh, differently uh, uh, Israel as recognized within the 1967 borders and uh, the territories beyond, be it occupied territories or be it eventually annexed territories, given that the annexation would not obviously be recognized uh, by, by Europeans. Uh, and the different revamping the differentiation agenda again means different things. It is about revisiting uh, differentiation there where it has already taken place such as, for instance, the 2005 technical arrangement, uh, such as the 2013 uh, arrangement over Horizon 2020, which, of course, now, in any case, annexation or no annexation, is going to come up uh, on the agenda again uh, with uh, the agreement eventually on Horizon Europe. Uh, it is about speeding up the unfinished differentiation agenda. Uh, for example, the territorial clause on uh, data transfers, uh, as well as on marketing standards for fruit and veg. And of course, and perhaps even more significantly, it is about developing a new differentiation agenda in a post-annexation reality. Uh, again, this is a box of tricks which will inevitably proceed regardless of what is done on the political and the economic front. And I think it's very important to separate entirely these different uh, planes. Um, now, very final thing that I wanted to say yeah, is, of course, well, not only that we will have to watch out not only about the way in which we 
talk consequences or write consequences and about the way in which we will do consequences. Uh, and this may end up meaning slightly different things. But, the, but the, particularly when it comes to the do, you know, the action point, you know, what will consequences mean in action? Uh, I think that this will ultimately depend on a number of different factors, uh, the first of which I hinted at earlier, exactly how annexation takes place and what are the immediate repercussions that it leads to, that will inevitably condition the overall context within which the action part of the consequences, not only the formulation of the consequences, will, will take place. Uh, the second key factor which has nothing to do with Israel or annexation is politics in member states. Uh, politics in member states are in a very deep uh, sort of phase of reshuffling, uh, given the depth of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and exactly, you know, who will come top of the heap, uh, if you like, if the jury is, is still out. I may be uh, sounding excessively optimistic perhaps here, but my hunch is that the political phase which opened uh, with the global financial crisis, uh, which was basically a phase of nationalist populism, may well end uh, in a post-COVID-19 uh, world for reasons that I don't have the time to get into now, but I'm happy to, to get back to. Third determinant, of course, is what happens in the United States. Uh, the, uh, the action part of European consequences will inevitably be very, very different depending on uh, who is the next president uh, of the United States. And then finally, what will be the reactions elsewhere in the region, uh, beginning, of course, with the League of Arab States, which, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in the recent past, uh, thinking about the reaction to the Trump plan, actually sort of manifested a, a, a rather unusual degree <laughs> of kind of purpose and unity, hmm? uh, which we hadn't seen for, for, for some time. And this will also inevitably affect the way in which Europeans understand their, their action. Anyway, I'll stop here. I think I probably went way over my seven minutes. Nimrod, right, back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are joined now by our member of Knesset, uh, Nitzan Horvitz. Nitzan is the chairperson of Merit's party. Uh, he is a member of the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. He is a former journalist and he was also a policy fellow at the Mitvim Institute before being elected uh, recently to the Knesset. Nitzan has been writing and uh, talking and being very active on issues relating to Israel-Europe relations, uh, to promotion of human rights, peace, democracy, and we're very glad uh, to have uh, him with us. Nitzan Horowitz, the floor is yours. Mute. That's it. You all hear me? It's okay? All right. So uh, thank you, Nimrod, and... Uh, I would like to thank Mitvim as well for this uh, interesting uh, meeting. Well, tomorrow is a very big day for us, Israelis and Palestinians, who are fighting hard um, since the beginning of this, uh, this uh, crazy idea of annexation. And we are doing everything we can in order to raise awareness among Israeli public opinion to the dangers of annexation. As we see it, annexation will put an end to the two-state solution, will put an end to this vision of Israel as a, as a Jewish and democratic nation, will put an end to the peace process and will make Israel an apartheid state de facto. It will also be a big burden on our economy now in the midst of uh, the corona crisis. It will be a security burden uh, to our military that would have to uh, control hundreds of new uh, borderlines. And of course, this will hurt tremendously the Palestinian Authority and our Palestinian neighbors. We have to remember that in those areas that might be annexed, tens of thousands of Palestinians are leaving and they have their homes, the land, the fields over there, and it all might be uh, uh, confiscated, uh, nationalized, etc. And so those people might be deported. And uh, this is a grave, grave danger. And we should all try to prevent it. Now, let me, let me uh, make uh, things uh, clear. The date is tomorrow, but nothing is being prepared. Um, 
militarily, administratively, uh, on the judicial side for any uh, such move of annexation, dramatic move. Why? Because the decision about the dimension of the annexation is not yet uh, made or is not yet known. So for instance, the military doesn't have any map, doesn't have any guidelines regarding annexation. The meaning of that is that it's all open to changes. Everything is open to changes. The things are not set yet. And so these events that uh, we are doing here with you, uh, the activity of Mitvim, our political activity in Israel and abroad, it's all directed to change the possible decision. Now, the scenarios vary tremendously. And um, we focus our efforts on all uh, fields that matter. Of course, the military establishment, the economy, the political sector, the media here in Israel, Jewish communities around the world, friends of Israel in the US, in Europe, etc., etc. And there are a lot of important voices coming and influencing um, the decision makers in the Knesset. And let me just give you an example. This morning, this very morning, uh, Minister of Defense Gantz, who is also the chairman of this uh, party, uh, Blue and White, is uh, Bibi's partner in this coalition government, declared that um, there are issues that are much more important to Israelis than annexation. For instance, one million unemployed people because of the corona crisis, and we have to deal with those important issues before annex annexation. So we see here um, a way how to uh, put annexation aside and to deal with the most important urging issues, which, is, which are now the corona crisis, uh, surge of corona, the unemployment, the economic crisis, social crisis, etc., etc. So this is what we do. We, we, we are very active here and among uh, uh, other circles overseas. And that's what we're doing. We think that everything can be changed and um, since nothing is being prepared, nothing is being done on the ground, it's all open for changes, uh, including the dimensions and the very essence of annexation itself, uh, which can also be tomorrow uh, as sort of a declaration and nothing will follow. So our goal is to stop annexation and bring Israel back to the peace track, dealing directly with the Palestinians on the two-state solution. This should be uh, the framework and the, uh, the goal. Because if we stop annexation and we, we're stuck with this military occupation that we had before, we achieved nothing. So the idea is to stop annexation and mobilize public opinion and the friends of Israel and our neighbors in order to go back to, uh, to the peace process and really promote the two-state solution, which is the only viable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Now, I, I'll stop here. Uh, so, and then I'll be glad to join you and to discuss these issues furthermore. Thank you. Thank you very much, a member of Knesset Nitzan Horowitz. Uh, we have a few minutes for a discussion following our first round of speakers. Uh, because member of Bundestag, Neil Schmidt, will have uh, to leave us soon, please give priority to any question that you may have to him first. You can write your questions in the chat box and we will point them out to the relevant speaker. The question that have been raised while you were speaking, uh, Niels and Natalie, was about international law. Uh, people are speaking about annexation as a violation of international law. And the question was, what do you mean when you refer to international law? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm in the middle of uh... A battle here in the Knesset. So, yeah, can you repeat the question, please, Nimrod? Yes, yeah, sorry about the question. First, and I will address it to a member of Bundestag, Dr. Neil Schmidt. What, what is the meaning of international law? When people are saying that annexation is a violation of international law, what law are they referring to? And uh, you would like me to uh, answer that? That's right. Well, you see, um, we have uh, an internationally recognized border uh, between us and Jordan, between us and Egypt and Lebanon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the uh, West Bank, like the Gaza Strip before, is an occupied uh, territory by Israel. 
And under international law, we should not annex uh, this land, which is inhabited by, uh, by the Palestinians. And uh, we have a framework of agreements with the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority since the Oslo Agreement, establishing the relations between the State of Israel and the Palestinian Authority. And no unilateral step, such as annexation or building settlements, for instance, is allowed according to uh, the international law. Now, annexation would be a grave violation of international law, and it doesn't matter if you were talking about big annexation or small annexation, or just few settlements or some places around the border. If it's done unilaterally, with no agreement on the Palestinian side, just, you know, Israel is doing this on itself with uh, the support of the Trump administration, perhaps, then it's against international law and it would hurt Israelis and Palestinians and Jordanians and will put in danger the entire relations in the area. And this is why we say against international law. Now, there, are, there is another aspect to that. You know, there, there is a, a international criminal responsibility, for example, within the ICC. This is also a possible venue. Now, we wouldn't like to, 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 to arrive there, of course. We'd like to avoid those uh, procedures within the ICC, but also annexation might be considered uh, a violation, like a war crime, and it might lead Israeli leaders to the ICC. So uh, in order to avoid this entire uh, complication with the annexation, we should avoid it. But not just because it's against international law, but it's against the fundamental interest of the Israelis and the Palestinians living in this land. And we should, you know, we should have an arrangement. We should, we should have this, this two-state solution and not trying to force one another into, into the corner by unilateral steps. That's the main idea on this issue. Thank you. We have a question to you, uh, Nathalie, about the legal issue that you mentioned specifically on Horizon 2020, but on other legal options as well. Well, just to clarify on this, as I said, I mean, this is a discussion that is going to come up anyway. Uh, and it's a discussion that's going to come up anyway because uh, Horizon 2020 is finishing uh, together with uh, the current multi-annual financial framework. Uh, as you know, we are uh, in, you know, in the midst or at the beginning, not really at the beginning, but anyway, in the midst of discussions of what the next budgetary cycle will look like. Uh, and within, obviously, the next multi-annual financial framework, there will be uh, new funds devoted to research, uh, the Horizon Europe program. Uh, and therefore, in any case, annexation or no annexation, uh, the question will obviously come up again as to which are the entities within partner countries, such as Israel, that can benefit uh, from uh, EU research funding. And obviously, the only entities that can, can benefit are those that are within uh, Israel, as recognized by the European Union. Now, this point, I mean, this, this, this point, which, as I said, you know, it applies not only to Horizon Europe, but it, it is basically about, as I said, revamping the entire differentiation agenda um, does not, uh, and I want to highlight this again, does not begin uh, at all uh, with annexation, but precisely because, uh, as was being uh, mentioned just now, uh, the violation of international law, I mean, you know, th there are violations of international law already going on, you know, I mean, uh, but, but, but it is true that one thing is to violate the laws of occupation, which is basically what is currently happening. And one thing is to go a step further through annexation. So what violation of international law is it? Well, it's the forcible uh, acquisition of territory by force. So in a sense, we simply move up, you know, uh, uh, to a, a different and, and let me say a far less um, debatable, controvertible kind of, you know, issue. Uh, it, it is a far more black and white issue and therefore the differentiation agenda, which is about making this very clear distinction about who can, who and what can benefit 
from forms of cooperation with the European Union in different fields, in research, in trade, uh, in police cooperation, in, you know, in, in, in the entire panoply of, of the EU-Israel relationship, and, and the broader and the deeper that relationship is, the more there is on the differentiation agenda plate, in a sense, yeah? Because it will be about making that distinction as to what is Israel and what is not Israel hmm? that will have to be applied to each and every sector. Thank you. We have a question to you, Dr. Schmidt, about whether Germany will be willing to take punitive measures against Israel should it move towards annexation. Yeah, first of all, I would like to uh, come back to the issue of international law and just uh, say that um, I could have not explained it better than Nissan has done it. I just want to add the fact that there are several UN resolutions, uh, resolutions from the UN Security Council announcing uh, some principles how to solve the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict and uh, unilateral annexation by Israel would uh, act counter to, to, this, uh, um, to these um, resolutions. Um, when it comes to punishing Israel, of course, any German policymaker is very reticent uh, about that. Um, so we avoid the talk about sanctions so far because there has not been any annexation uh, uh, taking place yet. Um, but there will be consequences um, of uh, any annexation undertaken, undertaken by the Israeli government. And these, kind of, uh, these consequences will be discussed within an EU framework. So there will be no bilateral response to that. Um, uh, as Natalie mentioned, sanctions policy is a very tricky issue. And sanctions only work um, if they are... Um, enacted in a collective manner uh, by as many international actors as possible. So uh, a unified EU policy towards Israel um, in this case will be of paramount um, importance. And so we will have to discuss this um, with our EU partners, but do not expect a German to be a, a sort of an initiator of this debate. For historical reasons, we are very, very um, um, careful about uh, discuss, discussing boycotts or sanctions. But since there's a privileged relationship between the EU and um, Israel uh, founded on a, founded on an association agreement, there's room for debate to which extent this privileged access of Israel towards the EU, towards uh, EU funds, um, will be continued in the future. So this relates to Horizon 2020 and other issues. And we've seen a start of this debate uh, two weeks ago when the European Parliament uh, discussed the renewal of the um, Open Skies Agreement between Israel and the EU. So we're going to have this kind of debates um, uh, on other topics as well. We refrain from putting a price tag, a precise price tag, on, the, uh, on a possible annexation for one reason, that is that we do not want to see the Israeli government to sort of price in uh, any price tag. So there will be consequences and it's good, in my view, it's better not to spell out these consequences in detail uh, uh, in this uh, moment. Uh, but uh, Israel, there's, the Israeli government must know that there will be a consequence, there will be consequences. When it comes to recognizing the state of Palestine, just to add this uh, also before I will have to leave, unfortunately. Um, recognition of a Palestinian state has never been the policy of the German government. And although many states have taken this step, 
Um, we have no, we have seen no progress on the Palestinian uh, issue or on, on the cause of uh, establishing a, a, a viable Palestinian state. So, as Natalie Totti uh, mentioned in her introductory remarks, this is quite an inconsequential um, step, and so I see, I don't. I do not see the German government or the German Bundestag uh, promoting this uh, this idea. Uh, it would not really help our Palestinian friends, uh, and so uh, we want to focus on a diplomatic on diplomatic efforts uh, for promoting a, a viable two-state uh, solution. So th this is maybe what I can tell you so far on on these issues. And I'm I will just listen some more, follow some more minutes, and then I will have to leave, um, unfortunately, because our parliamentary group meeting has been um, rescheduled and uh, starts earlier than usually, unfortunately. So, um, but um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you very much. It is important for us to also hear Palestinian perspective in this yeah. debate. And I would like to host and uh, ask uh, Farad Zayud, who is uh, in charge of European affairs and multilateral relations uh, for the Fatah uh, in Ramallah, uh, to, to intervene and uh, present his perspective. Farad, do you would like to uh, say a few words? Okay. Not now, maybe we'll go back to, to him uh, later. Uh, there was a, uh, let me check for the other question. Nimrod, just- uh, Excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Faraj, Faraj yes, speaking. Farage, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak to you in uh, uh, this uh, meeting. Uh, uh, as uh, we are uh, now uh, uh, discussing about the uh, responses of, uh, or the expected responses of the European uh, Union to uh, the, annex the annexation uh, decision that uh, Israel is uh, going to or about to uh, uh, implement. Uh, but uh, uh, regarding those issues that has been discussed or really uh, 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 has been uh, uh, talking about is uh, how uh, annexation is violating international law. Uh, but just I want to give uh, more comments about that. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, now there is a peace, uh, there is a peace agreement. Uh, and there is a peace process. This peace process was based on the two state solution that uh, two states on historic uh, Palestine, in historic Palestine, the state of Israel and uh, the state of Palestine uh, uh, to be uh, to, and uh, the state of Palestine to be established on the 1967 borders. It is the the basis of this uh, peace uh, process that was launched in 1993, and this state of Palestine has been recognized and now more of, uh, has been recognized for uh, for one from or by 140 states and has been accepted as a member of the United Nations in 2012. So the two-state solution is the only internationally agreed solution for uh, this conflict or to settle this conflict between us as Palestinians and the Israelis to have these two states to live in peace and security and recognized borders uh, between the two states. And of course, Jerusalem is a capital for the two states, east, east part for the Palestinian state and the west as a capital for the uh, for the uh, state of Israel. But uh, uh, occupation, occupation itself is a violation of international law. Now, the Israeli settlements on the occupied Palestinian lands on the 1967 borders, it in itself, in, in the core of international law, is a violation of international law. And it has its relation, or it is interrelated with other issues, uh, like uh, this is, I, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, from a legal uh, perspective. So, uh, any annexation or any uh, uh, sovereignty to be imposed on any uh, Israeli settlement or any piece of land, each one inch or centimeter 
on the occupied Palestinian land is a violation of international law. This does not mean that if, uh, like Atzion or whatsoever from those uh, settlements, illegal settlements, all settlement, all settlements on the occupied Palestinian lands are illegal, and any sovereignty to be imposed on these uh, settlements are also illegal. And the American administration cannot legalize by itself if to recognize or not that uh, sovereignty on the uh, Israeli illegal settlements. And the same on the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, the 1967 borders, that the land that is really uh, 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 has uh, decided to be the state of, of Palestine, now it is, there is a state, there is, a, a, there is, it's the state of Palestine, the recognized state of Palestine by 140 uh, countries and, re, and uh, as its membership in the international, uh, uh, in, the, in the United Nations, it is like a state uh, under occupation. The only thing that is to reach a peace settlement between us and the Israelis and to recognize because the peace process was based on a mutual recognition between the state of Palestine and, uh, uh, and the state of Israel. Uh, this is from uh, uh, political uh, or uh, legal. Uh, what, 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 what could be uh, uh, done uh, if Israel really to annex uh, uh, any part of uh, the occupied Palestinian territories. Of course, it's, uh, 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 Israel should not continue with uh, impunity. Israel or Netanyahu, Netanyahu I, uh, sorry for saying Israel, it's not, it's not that Israel, it is the Israeli uh, uh, government, the right wing, uh, wing government that was led by Netanyahu and the coalition government now. And the, the, it, this government should know that uh, uh, there will be Israel will not continue with impunity from any sanctions. There will be a price for such an annexation that will really make this uh, turmoil and it will fuel all the region, uh, not only in uh, the occupied Palestinian territories in West Bank and in Gaza Strip, but also it will take its, uh, 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 it, it will spread to another uh, Arab and Islamic countries. As an example, because of the peace agreement between Israel, the signed peace agreement between Israel and Jordan, it was like a result or a consequence of the peace process between uh, Israel and Palestine. And as Israel is really relinquishing and withdraw from uh, uh, its commitment to the peace process, of course, any or any, any, any consequences or what has uh, to be considered as a result of this peace process, uh, it, will, it, 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 it will be also stopped. And so uh, the, uh, the, uh, the King of Jordan, uh, Abdullah II, really said that if uh, uh, Israel really to implement this annexation, they, we will make a, a, a serious and real review for the continuation uh, of the peace process between Israel and Palestine, between Israel and, and, and Jordan. Uh, and at the same time, for all the violation of uh, international uh, law, uh, sorry, I will not uh, keep uh, speaking uh, too long, but uh, since it's an, uh, a violation of international law and for all those violations that has been committed against the Palestinian people and the Palestinian land, uh, as you know, as we are a member of the ICC, we hope that that Israel really will not force us or not uh, force us really to uh, really to head uh, uh, again and again and again for the ICC in order to uh, 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 file suits for another new uh, crime uh, for uh, uh, annexing or uh, imposing su uh, sovereignty on the state of Palestine. Regarding the recognition of the state of Palestine by the member states, I think, I think since uh, we are saying about two-state solution, and this uh, state of Palestine is recognized in the international, uh, in the United Nations, and many of the European uh, uh, countries, especially those are uh, members, the member states of the uh, of, uh, uh, European Union, are recognizing the state of Palestine. So why not uh, to recognize the state of Palestine as, uh, 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 as a push uh, for uh, uh, this uh, uh, peace process and to make some to bring some balance to this imbalance in power in economy in in, in politics in everything on the ground in in, uh, in in the international arena and here in in, in the region uh, uh, so uh, sweden uh, 
uh, has recognized and uh, so so what happened what was the problem with recognizing the state of palestine by 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 uh, sweden i think uh, another thing that uh, should really focus on that uh, there will be sanctions since israel will not uh, really enjoy impunity all the time, there will be sanctions. There sh should be a stick in addition to the carrot. Uh, uh, Israel should know that there will be uh, repercussions uh, and sanctions for uh, uh, implementing this process and it will take the whole region really into uh, an unknown uh, 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 bloody uh, situation that really no one could well, could predict uh, what consequences and repercussions really could lead such a, a process. And is it really for the benefit of peace? Is it for the benefit of the Palestinians and Israelis in, in this in the, on this land? Is it uh, for the benefit of the peace process? Uh, it, does anyone really expect that we will go back to any negotiations if Israel to implement? such an annexation where our borders will, will, will be. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, again. And I hope that uh, uh, to continue uh, uh, with the other questions uh, and uh, uh, discussions uh, in this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Farage, for your contribution. Um, I will have a final question for this round of debate, going to uh, Dr. Tochi Natalie about the uh, uh, unclarity of European position regarding trade with controversial territory. People mentioned the uh, Northern Cyprus, the Sahara. Uh, people say that there are different policies regarding different regions. Natalie, can you shed a bit of light uh, on that? Yes, and, and, and of course it's absolutely true, uh, meaning that in cases uh, of occupation, uh, the, 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 the practice, this has been part of the difficulty in terms of uh, the way in which the EU has practically approached uh, these issues has, has varied. And a big part of the work that has been going on in recent years has precisely been aimed at uh, trying to create greater coherence in this respect. Uh, but, but but again, you know, to connect this reflection uh, to the debate that we're having today, i.e. annexation, I think it is important that this um, creates, obviously in a very negative sense, a completely different degree of clarity, because we would no longer be simply talking about uh, how do the, does the EU react vis-a-vis uh, -vis territories which are occupied, but how does the EU react vis-a-vis -vis a territory which is illegally annexed? So it's not about the uh, illegal conduct of the occupation. Uh, it is about an entirely different type of violation of international law, which is why I think that the differentiation agenda would not only be revamped, but it would be treated in a categorically different way uh, from the way in which the differentiation agenda is treated in the case of Northern Cyprus, in the case of Abkhazia, in the case of the Western Sahara, and in, in all other cases that, uh, that you will be familiar with. Thank you. Uh, we do have, uh, of course, many more additional questions, uh, but we have to move on. And some of these questions will be uh, presented to the speakers in the next session. So we move on to a second round of speakers. Uh, the first one will be Martin Konechny, who is the director of the European Middle East Project, a, a Brussels NGO based on focusing international and European policies uh, on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nimrod. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I hope you hear me well. Um, so I will uh, go through uh, some of the same issues that Natalie Tocci, in particular, has spoken about already and add some more, some more detail to them. Um, I'll go through uh, the question of sanctions, uh, legal measures and differentiation, and also possible longer term impact on EU-Israel relations. Um, so first of all, I would say that sanctions with uh, capital S are very unlikely uh, to, be, to be adopted by the EU uh, because of the internal divisions. 
although uh, it is a standard tool of EU foreign policy and um, um, the EU's response to the Russian annexation of Crimea was uh, very much framed in terms of uh, sanctions, but uh, Israel, including its settlements, uh, has been in a category of countries for whom there has been a sort of informal political exception or a kind of taboo that, you know, sanctions and Israel, EU sanctions and Israel don't go together. Um, and I think that will hold for now, but I also see this uh, long-standing taboo. And by the way, that doesn't only apply to um, Israel, but, you know, there are other countries in that um, who, who enjoy this sort of political exception. Uh, uh, I see this taboo uh, being eroded. Um, uh, for example, uh, the British and uh, Dutch uh, Labour parties have uh, called for uh, sanctions or in the British case for uh, a ban on import of uh, settlement products. Um, uh, but, you know, the, the ban on import of Crimean products after the Russian annexation, that was actually done in the, in the form, of a, in a, a form of a sanction. Um, we also see that the EU's sanction policy, the trend is actually for it to expand. Um, so there are now sanctions uh, being um, applied um, in different ways uh, in more than 30 countries around the world. And the trend is to, uh, for this to grow in the long term. So the EU is now actually putting in place a new human rights sanctions mechanism that should kind of lower the political threshold for the possibility of applying sanctions uh, in response to human rights violations around the world. Um, so that said, again, I, I, th I think sanctions are, uh, with capital S, formal sanctions are very unlikely in the short term, but in the long term, the, the taboo is, is eroding. Um, now, um, when it comes to Horizon, Horizon Europe, um, that's, uh, in my understanding, that's in the hands of the European Commission because Israel has a, a sort of privileged status uh, among uh, several other countries who have a, a so-called associated status. And it means that the member states do not need to be involved um, when negotiating um, Israel's uh, participation. Um, so it's in the hands of the Commission, and I think it's uh, very unlikely that Israel would be cut out completely. But what I think is possible that uh, the annexation, uh, if it happens, will be factored in into uh, discussions uh, around the scope of Israel's participation in Horizon Europe and could lead to a scale down of this participation. So again, we're talking about the um, financial period in 2021 to 2027. The negotiations with Israel have not started yet, but um, that will um, happen quite soon. Now, uh, I would um, like to very much underline the legal side of things uh, that um, Natalie has already uh, mentioned. Uh, and um, a couple of days ago, uh, last week, actually seven European countries made a statement in the Security Council where they said that uh, it's because of their obligations under international law that uh, there will be consequences to their relations you know, with, with Israel. And uh, it's mainly about oh, what, again, Natalie has mentioned already, it's about uh, differentiation because uh, the EU cannot recognize uh, Israeli activities beyond the green line, which it considers illegal under international law. So in order to even just protect its own European legal order from the illegal acts being carried out in the occupied or in the, in the future annexed territories, uh, the EU needs to insulate uh, its relations from what, is, what Israel is conducting beyond the green line. So it's more of a passive rather than offensive and, and political measure, but um, it can actually have significant uh, implications for the bilateral relations not least because the EU is Israel's top trading partner. So even these smaller technical legal steps can actually have uh, quite, uh, quite some tangible uh, impact. Um, so, uh, f and the other thing to, to understand about this is that uh, the friction can come from both sides uh, because it's not only the EU that will uh, probably double down on differentiation and will need to look at um, strict uh, um, respect for EU law, 
in its relations with Israel, but also from the Israeli side, uh, there will be uh, um, probably greater reluctance to accept any territorial differentiation because what is the whole point of annexation? It's about uh, symbolically removing the green line and making sure that Male Adumim is, is treated the same way as uh, Tel Aviv or Ramat Gan. Um, and um, we have seen these things already clash in the past uh, when there were negotiations on Horizon 2020, six, six years ago, when it was Israel actually threatening at some point not to participate in Horizon uh, 2020 at all, after which the Israeli scientific community uh, pushed back against the government and, and, and lobbied very strongly for um, Israel to accept this territorial differentiation in order for the Israeli uh, scientific and research sector to be able to participate. We saw the same with the um, bilateral treaty on cultural, co cultural cooperation, uh, I think two or three years back, uh, when it was Miri Regev who um, um, uh, basically um, rejected uh, acceptance um, of an agreement uh, on this scheme with the EU, again, because of uh, the, the differentiation. Uh, clause from the EU side. So I think uh, we're likely to see more of this friction, uh, friction coming from both sides uh, uh, in, in, the, in the future, and part of it will be uh, legal, as I mentioned. So these things are very much in the hands of the European Commission, primarily on the EU side. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I would also like to stress the role of the European Court of Justice. Um, which is also an important uh, kind of guardian of uh, European law, even in situations where the political um, class is, is reluctant to, to act. And we have seen this in uh, the cases of Northern Cyprus and Morocco. In, in the case of Northern Cyprus, there were three rulings by the European Court of Justice uh, 20 years ago as a result of which, uh, basically, uh, the trade between, there is no direct trade between Northern Cyprus and Europe. There is limited indirect trade. So even if we do not have a, 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 an explicit ban on imports of products from Northern Cyprus, as we do have uh, with, with Crimea, uh, de facto, because of the Court of Justice, uh, the situation is not so much different. And uh, with, with Morocco, uh, the, the Court of Justice has also struck down some bilateral agreements uh, because of Western Sahara. We have seen already two judgments from the Court of Justice, um, also in relation to Israel and its settlements, uh, the Brita case in 2010, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the case related to Sagot and the labeling of settlement products um, uh, last year. So uh, it is possible that there will be more of this in the future and uh, Israeli annexation can create new legal, more legal friction, new legal grounds actually for, for challenging um, EU-Israel relations also uh, in, in the court. Um, I would make perhaps one more point which would be more like internally directed uh, uh, towards, uh, towards the EU, which is, um, you know, uh, the EU is, uh, and what makes this discussion, I think, quite, quite difficult uh, is that the EU is not very far in preparing its response. Although the annexation has been on the agenda of Israeli politics very clearly for at least a year, if not longer. But uh, only one month ago, one and a half months ago in mid-May, uh, was there a sort of commitment to prepare an options paper, which is what Natalie Tochi already mentioned, but um, a month and a half later, and just one day before, you know, the first uh, annexation steps could potentially be taken, there is still no options paper uh, being put out. Uh, also, the commission has not so far examined the uh, legal consequences uh, for bilateral relations, which again, those are not options, but those are rather uh, legal obligations. And uh, we have seen statements from the President of the European Commission saying, basically, we will wait and see what Israel does, if Israel does anything, and then we will look into uh, what we will do. And I think uh, that's a very reactive role, which um, um, 
does not, uh, which uh, undermines the influence and the relevance of the EU in this debate. The EU usually likes to say that it plays a preventative role in, in foreign relations, but uh, here we are basically uh, waiting and it, this makes it easier uh, to dismiss any possible consequences from the EU side if there is not yet uh, even a proper process to identify this. The Commission, the European Commission has called itself a geopolitical commission, but uh, so far in this case, we don't see that being uh, put into practice. That said, slowness does not mean that nothing will happen. It's just that the Europeans are being, being very slow. And that leads me to the final point with which I will close, which is um, beyond, the, uh, beyond the things that I, that I said, I think it's important to think long term not only in terms of the immediate short-term response uh, by the EU, but what will be the long-term opportunity cost to um, developing relations uh, with Europe. Because uh, the gulf between uh, the EU and Israel politically uh, will become bigger if, um, if Israel goes ahead uh, with formal annexation. Um, and um, now, the, on the other hand, um, Israel already has privileged relationship with the EU. The EU gave out most of the benefits um, over the previous years. So it could say, you know, there isn't so much more that we would want from the EU. But on the other hand, uh, the economies are changing. Uh, there's technological development, artificial intelligence, uh, etc. So you cannot go on uh, based on the old treaties forever. You need to keep updating them. And that, I think, will, is something that will be uh, uh, made uh, much, much harder. Uh, and that is not only in the scenario of formal annexation, but also in a scenario where, where formal annexation doesn't happen and we have a continued occupation or de facto annexation, which is maybe what some, some other speakers will, will want to uh, emphasize. I will stop here for now. Thank you, Martin, also for expanding our point of view beyond immediate annexation into long-term prospects and other options that are on the table. I would like to turn now to Dr. Muriel Asebo, who is a senior fellow at SVP, the German Institute for International and Security Affairs. Muriel's areas of expertise include security in the East Mediterranean, German, European, and American policies towards the region and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, with Muriel, we had the pleasure of uh, working together uh, with Pax, a Dutch partner, on a report looking at divisions within the European Union and how they impact uh, the Europe role on Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking and conflict resolution. And maybe that will also be part of uh, uh, remarks. Muriel, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nimrod. Uh, let me add my thanks for the organizers to do such a timely and important debate, and I'm very happy to be part of it. Um, I was asked to focus mainly on Germany, and as I stem from Germany, um, still, there is reasons to do that, and good reasons to do that. Uh, for one, of course, Germany is a big and influential member state in the EU. Um, also, starting tomorrow, it will have the rotating presidency of both the EU and the Security Council. And Martin has already touched upon that. Now we have a German head of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, which of course, as the head of the commission doesn't represent Germany, but she is informed by the German debate and the German thinking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So there is, uh, Germany is a key player when it comes to European action on annexation and on the conflict. What should be expected from Germany in that regard? I think in order to know what to expect from Germany, it's important to understand that unilateral annexation, which would formally end the Oslo process, which would signal a very clear rejection of a negotiated two-state settlement, and which is in breach of international law, is a particular challenge for Germany. Why? Because it juxtaposes two lessons that German policymakers have drawn from the past, from the responsibility derived from the Shoah and the military aggression of Germany in two world wars. And these two lessons are one that Germany 
has been a very strong supporter of multilateralism, of a rules-based international order of EU integration, and a defender of international law. And on the other hand, it has built special relations with Israel and Israel's security has become conceived as a central element of Germany's raison d'etat. Now to reconcile these two lessons drawn, Germany has been a very strong supporter of a two-state solution, has been very critical of settlement and annexation policies, has been the largest bilateral donor for Palestinians. But then at the same time, the engagement for a two-state approach has been undermined by the endeavor to be seen as the best friend of Israel, Not, of course, uh, after the US, um, and by the endeavor to have ever closer relations between the two countries. And therefore, the, the government of Germany has rejected anything that would look like confronting Israel, of conditioning support to Israel, uh, anything that would be seen as punitive measures, or only measures that are rejected by Israel, even though in other cases we would support them, like recognition of a state of Palestine, like Palestine seeking justice at the ICC. And thus, um, I would claim what Germany has actually done so far and is continuing to do is it's refraining from having an effect on the cost benefit calculation of decision makers in Israel. And in that dramatic situation that we're currently speaking about, I think Germany as a friend of Israel should actually weigh in to prevent annexation from happening for a whole host of reasons that have already been mentioned by Nitzan and others on this podium. Um, is this what we see? I'm not sure. I see very contradictory signals. On the one hand, on the, one hand the, the language regarding the rejection of acquisition of territory by force, the rejection of unilateral annexation is clear, and it has been clear amongst others at the occasion of the visit of the Foreign Minister Heiko Maas to Israel earlier this month. On the other hand, we see or we witnessed at that occasion a signing of agreements on all kinds of issues that signaled business as usual. You just go on signing agreements and deepening uh, the relation. Also, the Minister, the, the minister of Foreign Affairs has, has continued to stress that Germany rejects sanctions, rejects any kind of threats, rejects punitive measures, rejects recognition of the state of Palestine, and he has also insisted that annexation in the West Bank couldn't be compared to annexation of Crimea. All these signals must have been very comforting to the government of Israel, and I think the signal that is being given is that annexation in the end will be cost-free, at least from the German side, and there is no price tag. Um, Niels has spoken about the motion that the German parliament will most probably adopt tomorrow. Now, don't expect anything from that motion in terms of a push for a stronger stance. Um, that will be even falling behind some of agreed parameters by the European Union and the Security Council. And just one sentence on the head of the commission, uh, Martin has made the point already. It's interesting to see that a head of commission that has started her, uh, her term with stressing that this should be a geopolitical commission has been silent on the issue of annexation, has been, when asked about, uh, has been very reactive, bureaucratic, rather than proactive or forward-looking. And again, the inexistence of an options paper uh, lining out what options are on the table, I think have led to a situation where Europeans have missed a chance to weigh in and be heard. Is that gonna change? Are we going to see a different uh, approach now by Germany? I think it will be very difficult for Germany 
as it will be leading the European Union or assuming the presidency for the next half year to assume a strong position. And one of the reasons is what you have just mentioned, Nimrod, that it's very unlikely that the lack of unity, the division among EU member states can actually be overcome. Now, I also want to be clear, Europeans are agreed in their rejection of annexation. What they are not agreed upon is how to react to it and what measures to adopt. And here we are see three blocks um, that basically all pull in different directions. And it's very difficult for these blocks to come to common conclusions and to adopt common measures. And one of the reasons why we see these three blocks is exactly the government of Israel or the prime minister of Israel that has worked on deepening these divisions and creating these, well, first creating and then deepening these divisions over the last few years. Of course, making use of differences of interest among EU member states on other issues as well. But the result is that then the EU is not taken seriously. It's seen as toothless by Israeli officials and policymakers. And I've attended quite a number of webinars over the last few weeks and you can feel the condescending way how Israeli officials treat European officials in these seminars. Um, still, I think it's important to see that even if EU disunity remains, it will not necessarily impede a strong European response because there are also options for the EU institutions for single member states to act and for coalition of member states. And while it's true that sanctions need unanimity, unanim sorry, sanctions need the unanimity of member states, with new agreements, it's the other way around. You also need all member states and depending on the agreement, the agreement of the European Parliament to give their consent to new agreements. So one single member state can block those. And that is something to be considered in the future. Um, I want to say a few more issues that I think will happen regardless of Germany taking a strong stance, regardless of the EU agreeing on things or not. We will still have an impact of annexation on EU-Israel relations because, as has been pointed out, there needs to be, legally, there needs to be a review of all agreements with Israel, but not only with Israel, also with the PLO and the PA, to make sure that those agreements do not unintentionally legitimize annexation. There needs to be more consistent and deepened differentiation measures based on Security Council Resolution 2334 and the November 2019 EU Court of Justice ruling on correct indication of origin. This is something that member states have to do. And Europeans will need to find new terms of engagement with the Palestinians. If this is no longer about state building, is this is not longer about a two-state objective, then what would be the basis actually for engaging with the Palestinians and uh, I'm sure this is not only a question of objectives and contractual relations, it's also a question of funding and support, which is very likely to be reduced. Um, last but not least, an impact um, will be that while Europeans will not easily throw overboard a two-state approach, in view of annexation and in view of the trends on the ground that we have been witnessing over the last years, Europeans will have to open up to exploring other options in cooperation with local actors to see what they hold in terms of conflict resolution. And I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Muriel. Our next speaker is Yu uh, Lovat. Yu Lovat is a policy fellow at the European Council for Foreign Relations. His areas of expertise include the Middle East, conflict prevention and resolution, and identity politics. Yu uh, is the chair of the EU Middle East project, of which Martin uh, is a director. 
and he has been reading quite extensively on the differentiation policy of the EU towards Israel, which has been mentioned in the first session, and he would like to elaborate on that. You, please. Thanks, Nimrod. And uh, thank you again to all the organizers for putting to get together this very uh, timely discussion. Um, at this point in the discussion, all I can really do is uh, to, to, uh, to repeat and emphasize what was so well said uh, by the previous articulate uh, panelists. Um, and so, you know, as was said, I think it's quite clear that that formal annexation of West Bank territory will not lead to, um, you know, as Martin said, sanctions with a capital S, but there will be some implications. And we've heard a bit about what that is. And so let me just summarize them very quickly and clearly. You know, I think the major vector for, for the European response will be differentiation. Um, you know, as we talked about, that differentiation will come at the level of the EU, uh, the level of EU-Israel relations. Um, and that is not beholden to, uh, to, to the requirement of obtaining 27 member states to agree. It can be done for, uh, through the institutions, by the institutions, on the basis of existing uh, uh, legal and uh, policy uh, decisions. Um, but this differentiation uh, can also be done by member states at the at the level of their bilateral relations uh, with Israel, you know, and uh, whether that includes a reviewing of existing relations, uh, but also applying it to future relations. Um, so this could affect, you know, so we've already seen this affecting research and development agreements at a, at a bilateral level, um, but it could also, you know, extend into, say, uh, uh, treaties on the avoidance of double taxation, which seems like residents of some settlements can actually benefit from. Um, so it can go into other areas. Um, and of course, I think, you know, this is, if we do see de jure annexation, the, the narrative will also shift, you know, the framing and the discourse. Now, one could argue from a legal point of view uh, that Israel has already committed potential, you know, violations or violations of international law and, and potential war crimes, which are, which are, uh, perhaps to be investigated by the ICC, but certainly, you know, the focus will be on that much more going forward. And I think that has implications in, uh, also on the level of, uh, you know, private business dealings uh, and interactions with Israel and the settlements. Um, so we've seen, for example, a number of especially pension funds uh, divesting um, uh, from businesses with links to the Israeli settlements. Most recently, I think in the Netherlands, ABP, which is a big pension fund divesting from Israeli banks, of their uh, support for, for settlement construction. Um, so I think, you know, you're, we're moving into an atmosphere in which, you know, relations with Israel and the settlements become much more problematic from a, not just a legal point of view, but also from a reputational and financial point of view. So I would flag that as something as that, and as another area where there probably will be an impact. Um, and again, I think this sort of new shifting, the shifting narrative and public discourse, you know, will also add a lot of burdens and strain on the relations between the EU and what I would call Green Line Israel. Um, so at the moment, you know, I think it, it's, it's fair to say that, um, that the perception of Israel uh, in Europe is still largely, you know, Israel as sort of a liberal democratic state. You know, of course, you know, Europeans are aware of its actions in occupied territories, but I think that that framing is still something that's uh, very much in the minds of most Europeans. But I think, you know, after the Euro annexation, that, that, that image of Israel, I think, will come under a lot of strain. And you know, already we've seen increasing usage of sort of the term apartheid. Um, now, one can agree or disagree with, with that framing and, and description, but I think there's no doubt that, you know, that the equation of Israel as an apartheid state will grow uh, in, in, at least in the sort of the public, and I would also say that the policy discourse uh, after formal annexation, and that puts strain on the, the on the existing uh, EU-Israel relationship and makes it much more difficult to renew and grow that relation going, for, uh, going forward. And I would say also, you know, in a situation in which, um, you know, that discourse and narrative becomes more predominant and in which uh, the possibility of reaching a two-state solution recedes, at least in terms of perception of European publics and European states. Now we can argue whether two states is still possible or not, and maybe it wasn't possible, you know, 10 years ago, but certainly there's still a perception amongst uh, European states and that, that there still is a route. Now, if that perception disappears, um, then I think, you know, it creates clear policy dilemmas for, uh, for the European Union and its member states, and we've sort of heard a bit about that. 
Um, but I think, you know, what we're, we're likely to see, and we've already started to see the shift, is increasing emphasis on the need for equal rights. So, of course, you know, I think it's clear that the EU and, member state, the EU and its member states uh, much prefer to achieve and guarantee equal rights through two states. But I think if that perception that two states is no longer possible, then I think European uh, decision makers uh, will be forced to accept the fact that if two states is not possible, the only other alternative that could be acceptable would be to fulfill equal rights through one state. You know, I, I think it would be very difficult to imagine uh, European governments, even in a context in which they want to privilege relations with Israel, it's still difficult to imagine them signing up for a perpetual situation of uh, apartheid or, you know, to use it or institutionalized discrimination and unequal rights for Palestinians in a one state, which is the EU's current language. So I think, you know, that's something else I think Europeans and Israelis uh, and Palestinians will have to, to, to grapple with. And let me finish this by saying also, if, if the de jure annexation doesn't happen, I think there's also going to be some questions for European policy. You know, will the reaction be to actually breathe a sigh of relief and say, thank God the worst has been averted. Now we can go back to cheerleading and supporting what's been going on for the last 20 years which, you know, for many people, myself included, I'd say what we've been going through is the de facto version of what we're trying to avoid. So de facto, you know, we already have, uh, you know, I think an entrenched system of, of discrimination uh, in the occupied territories. We have open-ended uh, occupation, Gaza suffocating. We have, you know, the erosion of the two-state, the territorial erosion of the, the basis for two-state solution through settlement activities. These are all things that have, um, there's been much more focus on these trends at the moment because of de jure annexation. I think the question is, if formal annex annexation does not happen, does the focus remain on those issues? Or do we kind of all move on and, and talk about other things? And that goes back, back to Nitsan's point, which is, you know, there should it be returning to, to where things were, but, um, you know, as an alternative, but trying to move forward uh, and, to, to, and to, you know, to move forward in a way that can allow for a meaningful peace process. And my last point would be, I think you know probably all of us and most of us would agree that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict should be resolved through negotiations. I think there's a question: is you know how can we move forward with the peace process currently if the Israeli government cannot even say the, the, the words two-state solution or cannot sign up to anything that could lead to a to a viable and sovereign uh, Palestinian state, state and to a, a solution that actually ends the occupation for Palestinians. Thank you, you. Several of the speakers refer to how the EU is being perceived in Israel and whether policymakers and politicians in Israel think that Europe can have an influence. Uh, our next speaker is Noah Landau. Noah Landau is a diplomatic correspondent of the Haaretz newspaper. She's been covering Israel's foreign policy and she can reflect on how the EU and its leverage is being perceived within our political system. Uh, Noah is a member of Haaretz editorial board. She previously served as the head of the Aretz News Department and is the editor of the English edition of Aretz. Noah. Hi everyone. First of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. I enjoyed listening to all the previous speakers. Uh, so first of all, as the journalist on board, I'll try to confuse you all with some uh, more facts and details from behind the scenes and start by saying that at the moment, and although things tend to change very quickly around here, no one in Israel is expecting anything major to happen tomorrow. Not only because Israel is after all in the Middle East and the sense of time is very flexible here, but also because while everyone's asking when will annexation happen, uh, Israeli decision makers do not even know what is exactly annexation. So this week, Israel is hosting a White House delegation, uh, which includes uh, Kushner's envoy, Avi Belkovich, who replaced uh, Jason Greenblatt, if you remember him, and a group of State Department officials, uh, which seem to kind of uh, be chaperoning Ambassador Friedman. Uh, if you've been following, you know, the different approaches uh, within the Trump administration regarding annexation, this time there's a whole delegation kind of like making sure that everyone's on the same message. And as we are speaking at this very moment, they just begun their meeting with uh, Netanyahu. Uh, I also want to point out that I don't think it's a coincidence that Brian Hook is also uh, here in Israel this week. And I think all these uh, different conversations are 
uh, somehow linked. We don't know exactly how, but that's what it feels like uh, from behind the scenes. Anyway, according to sources who were in several of uh, their meetings uh, here, the White House's delegation, uh, they still mostly wanted to understand what Israel wants. And by that, they mean what, what kind of compromise can Netanyahu and Gantz achieve uh, amongst them. So yesterday, after the meeting uh, that uh, the White House delegation had with Gantz, um, they uh, they said that uh, he he said that everything that's not related to the fight against the coronavirus will have to wait, uh, which you know sounds as another sign that we won't really see anything major uh, tomorrow, which is why you know he uh, takes the liberty to say it. And uh, Netanyahu said in response that Gantz doesn't decide or will not decide, and uh, anyways is not a factor in the decision. But he also told party members in a closed session uh, that it, it will not be uh, tomorrow and that uh, by uh, setting July 1st as the due date, they actually meant that this is the starting point for the discussions. Um, and it's true that uh, in principle, Netanyahu doesn't really need guns and blue and white to proceed uh, with the annexation plans. But it is something that the Americans uh, prefer, that it will be something that uh, both uh, main factions of the government uh, agree on. And blue and white, uh, they were very uh, enigmatic about what they actually um, think about annexations, but they do have a set of uh, specific uh, conditions uh, uh, to any annexation plan. So their conditions is, first of all, it has to be uh, inseparable from the whole uh, Trump peace plan. Uh, it needs to be a part of a wider uh, diplomatic uh, plan somehow. It needs to be uh, so somehow a step that will not harm existing uh, peace agreements, which mostly means Jordan, of course. And it means uh, they also say that um, they want to see some... Um, maybe uh, uh, steps uh, towards the Palestinians as well. So it will look like this is more of like uh, a, dip a diplomatic plan and not a unilateral step. Um, also, Gan said uh, several times now that uh, one of their conditions is that no Palestinian will be annexed. So uh, the whole question of whether uh, they'll be given citizenship or not will not, uh, uh, will not be a part of uh, whichever annexation plan that they will agree on. So supposedly there are now four scenarios on the table, uh, which Netanyahu discussed with Gantz. Uh, only one of them is the bigger original plan, which means annexation of 30% of the West Bank. Uh, but the rest of them are what they call more symbolic steps, which means uh, annexing one or more major settlements, for example, the area of uh, E1, uh, no, here's Male Dumim, uh, or Gush Etzion, uh, without any additional areas around them. So it means annexing only the settlements themselves. I think this scenario will be the hardest for the international community and European specifically. Because if you think about it, uh, what will actually change on the ground? I mean, Israel already annexed the settlements from many aspects. Um, and this will be, I think it will be a dilemma for the international community because while everyone's now talking about the bigger, uh, wider annexation plan, and, uh, you know, trying to prevent it or to postpone it, um, it might feel like some kind of a, a victory or some kind of a, a, um, <laughs> something that's much more culpable if, if Israel just uh, uh, symbolically uh, and emotionally kind of like declares annexation of areas that are already uh, de facto annexed, like uh, you uh, mentioned before. Um, so, and I'm not, I'm not sure that at least the people I'm speaking to, I'm not sure that uh, uh, the European community is really prepared for that scenario. I mean, everyone's talking about, we just spent, you know, a whole discussion talking about, uh, you know, sanctions and differentiation and recognizing Palestine. And th these are all like uh, doomsday scenarios, right? Like what could be our most uh, serious response? And I don't hear a lot of discussions about what will happen if we will see a smaller 
uh, plan, which looks like, you know, th this is what's actually on the table at the moment. From a realistic point of view, what they're talking about, again, everything could change, and journalists are very bad prophets, but from my sources, people who are in the meetings, what's actually on the table is a smaller plan. Um, so this is maybe something that's worth thinking about. What, what would be the international response to something uh, much more uh, symbolic? Um, and the last thing I want to say is that uh, I hear a lot from Europeans and also from Israelis about, you know, all the, all the realistic difficulties that uh, Europe has in uh, preventing uh, Israeli annexation. Uh, and we spoke about that uh, today also. Um, but I do want to remind everyone that there is a, a small Palestinian village uh, called Khan al -Akhmal. And this village still exists. And I think uh, some people uh, tend to forget uh, the story because, you know, it's small, it's very specific. Uh, but this was a major victory for the specifically the European community. Uh, I mean, no one else was really fighting it, uh, you know, apart from uh, uh, the Palestinians and some uh, very few groups in the Israeli left, uh, the ones that really cared about Khan al Ahma were the Europeans. So, you know, you can say uh, that, uh, uh, like some Israelis do, that Europe uh, is divided, or that which I don't think is true on the, uh, on, on the issue of annexation specifically, but you can claim that, okay, there's a division and that, um, maybe Europe is not prepared uh, for real sanctions and uh, the response will be much more mellow and so on. But you do need to remember that when the European community wanted to prevent something uh, from happening uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian arena, they did. They did. Khan al still exists. And, you know, I heard that uh, Netanyahu, um, uh, some people actually, some uh, European parliament members told me that, well, maybe Netanyahu didn't care so much about that, so this is why it was easy, but annexation is something else. Um, <laughs> but I, I will also want to say um, that aspect that um, I, I, I go to briefings with Netanyahu all the time, and I see how journalists that are affiliated with the right wing in Israel keep asking him about Khan al This This wasn't something that Netanyahu didn't care about, and it's not something that his voters don't care about. They kept asking about that, and they kept pushing for him uh, to evacuate them, and, um, and he didn't. And that was because of Europe. So just to point that. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. Also for giving us uh, other examples to, to compare to. Uh, we have uh, several questions that have been asked throughout the session. I try to collect them and present them in short to the speakers. We will then give you a, a short period of time to, to respond. Uh, so the questions are, first, uh, regarding the option that Natalie Tochi mentioned, of stopping financial aid to the Palestinians, what will that look like and how significant it will be? Uh, second, uh, much of the European activism uh, happening today is geared towards preventing annexation. Supposing we're reaching a time in which preventing annexation is no longer an option, what will then be the goal of European policies uh, towards Israel uh, after annexation is already being made? Uh, third, a question about specific member states. We've been talking a lot about the EU. We've been speaking some about Germany. What about countries like France and Sweden from one side, Hungary from the other? What are they expected to do? Fourth is a question about incentives for peace. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in this uh, webinar about sanctions and pressures, but could the European Union promote incentives to advance peacemaking, not incentives to prevent annexation, but rather some incentive that can move Israelis and the Palestinians closer to reaching a, a, an agreement between them, or at least empower those in both societies who are supporting peace. And the final question is, is about uh, connections between Europeans and other international actors who oppose annexation, namely the Democrats in the US or countries in the Arab world. Uh, is such coordination happening? and how beneficial it could be. Okay, so not each one of you has to answer all these questions, but please let's go perhaps in reverse order. And those of you who want to relate to one or more of the questions can do so uh, quite shortly. 
Uh, Noah, would you like to, to relate to any of these? Which one you choose? Uh, I choose. Let's go with the US and the Democrats. Um, do you see yeah. a relation between you know, those opposing annexation in Israel and, your, and American counterparts? We've been hearing about guns working with the White House. We see opposition within the Democratic Party. How does that linkage uh, happen? So I think at the moment, um, Gantz is much more, you know, now before the elections, Gantz was allegedly the opposition. So we had a lot of uh, contact with the Democratic Party to show that, you know, he could, he could build an alternative uh, bridge between Israel and the US and also US Jews. But, you know, since he joined the government, I actually see him, more, you know, trying to um, um, be seen more as someone who could talk to the Trump administration, not the Democrats necessarily. So th that's about Gantz. But I also think that if we look at uh, Netanyahu and how the fact that Trump is uh, dropping in the polls affects his decision about annexation, uh, the, there are uh, two groups of people in his entourage. Um, talking about this issue in very different ways. One group insists that this actually makes Netanyahu want to annex more and faster because we need to grab everything that we can before Trump leaves office. That's one group. And the other claims that Netanyahu, uh, when he sees the polls and you know he takes into consideration the fact that Biden might win, and this is all very reversible because uh, annexation, you know, in the end, it's, a, it's an act of recognition by the US. So there isn't much more to it. So it's very reversible by a different uh, administration. And that actually makes Netanyahu think that maybe it's not the smartest move if uh, Trump is going to lose in the end and it will cause a lot of troubles for his government with the next democratic president so i don't know which one of these groups is right but these are uh the two opinions that netanyahu hears thanks noah uh, you love it please um i'll uh, i'll touch on the aid to the palestinians and then the uh, the offer of an upgrade or something positive uh, for Israel and Israelis to incentivize peace. So on the, the aid to Palestinians, I think the simple answer is no one knows. I mean, clearly we know it's an issue, um, but we don't even know if the PA will be around in a month or two. I mean, obviously I think the general consensus is it will be, but there's still a lot of uh, contradictory messaging from the Palestinian side. Um, so I think, you know, that this will be a, a conversation that will grow on the European side as time, you know, as, as the perception of two states diminishes and the, the perception of the viability of Palestinian state building efforts and the PA as the nucleus for that state also recedes. But also let's bear in mind, you know, when we look at uh, European funding to the Palestinians, what we're talking about is the specific component that goes to the PA. Um, I think, you know, because there will be other flows which go to Palestinian civil society and humanitarian projects, et cetera, which in my view will probably go uh, unaffected at least for the medium term. Uh, in terms of the, the incentives, I mean, so the EU did, did uh, uh, for those, uh, those uh, EU policy geeks, such as myself, Martin and others will remember that the EU, I think it was in 2014 or before 2013, um, offered a special privileged partnership uh, to Israel in order to, you know, to again, to try to incentivize. Um, I think it's clear that that was a bust. Um, like most people didn't hear about it. The Israeli government didn't seem that that interesting and we actually did some polling like in 2014 and it found a plurality of of israelis i think it was like 42 percent did it think that such an offer would really affect their own decisions when it comes to to the occupation so i think you know clearly there needs to be a balance between incentives and disincentives but i think it's fair to say with very few exceptions up until now the focus has been on on incentives and i would say that probably israel has already obtained through the last 20 years of uh, growing relations with the EU has pro probably obtained everything that it needs from the relationship with the EU. Like there's not much more we can give to Israel besides from actual EU membership that would be significant enough, I think, to really affect uh, internal Israeli calculations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Muriel Asbu. Thanks, Nimrod. Uh, I would like to follow on where you just uh, stopped. I think in, at the center of European efforts should not be 
uh, incentives that are outside of the negotiations. I want to say incentives have to be uh, linked to what Toby, I think, wrote in his uh, chat remarks, uh, the content of the negotiations. And I think here the European incentives are very clear. Uh, Europeans have put out parameters of how uh, they envision a two-state settlement. Um, and that would include some of the things you asked for. That is a uh, solution on Jerusalem uh, where Jerusalem would be uh, recognized as the capital of both Israel and Palestine um, and other issues. And you can go back to the July 2014 Council conclusions to look at the details of these parameters. So I think this is at the center of Europeans, uh, what Europeans are offering and should be offering. Now, of course, they can uh, add things like special privileged partnership, they can add things like EU membership, but membership, but all of that is not relevant, I think, to Israeli action on two states. Um, so the political will uh, for engaging in compromise will not be increased by offering incentives that don't have anything to do with this issue at stake. Um, and therefore, what I think is Europeans should engage now in preparing the ground for a return to negotiations once you have somebody in the White House with whom you can work on that and once you have leaderships that are willing to engage in negotiations. And when Europeans do that, they should also take into account the lessons learned from previous attempts made in terms of multilateral framework for negotiations. I mean, there is reasons why the quartet didn't work out. And some of these lessons learned, I think, have to do that parameters were not clear on which negotiations were based. There was no even-handed mediator engaging in these negotiations. We didn't have an impartial oversight mechanism looking at how the sides would implement steps agreed upon. And we didn't have substantial security guarantees. So there is a number of things that Europeans can offer and there are other things they cannot offer. They can only offer in cooperation with the United States. Um, but I think this is something Europeans should be engaging in from now for the future. Thank you, Maria. Uh, Martin. Right, so I'll pick the remaining two ones, I guess. Um, so the, well, the first one of those was about what will happen after annexation if prevention fails. And uh, so what will happen is that those consequences that we've been talking about, consequences to bilateral relations, they will be playing out over years. I mentioned this is a long-term thing, not only short-term. And um, so uh, I always think about it uh, as, um, um, you know, on two fronts. Uh, the, on one hand, uh, the development of EU-Israel relations will be constrained uh, kind of uh, from, from the front, and there may actually be a regression. And it will also be constrained from developing sort of sideways, from uh, expanding uh, the ties into the occupied or annexed uh, territory because of the differentiation principle. So uh, the Europeans are likely to hold these two lines, and that will lead to uh, quite a lot of friction uh, over uh, the next years, more than before, uh, is my prediction. Beyond that, uh, I think uh, we could see the Europeans moving more into um, the language of equal rights for all um, uh, inhabitants uh, living between um, the sea and the, and the river under Israel's effective control, uh, and perhaps even um, suggesting that if the two-state uh, solution uh, uh, becomes impossible, then the only legitimate alternative would be a one-state solution of equal rights um, for all those people. Uh, living in that space, but that will very much depend on uh, the Palestinian response and Palestinian strategy uh, because the Europeans are unlikely to take the lead uh, uh, on this themselves. The other question was about different member states. Uh, France, Sweden, Hungary was mentioned. Um, so those are actually good ones to choose. I would say, first of all, in Hungary, um, 
Hungary has um, been in a category of its own. People often talk about you know, uh, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, etc., as being uh, the stalwart supporters of Israel or the Israeli government. Uh, and that's true, uh, but uh, then there's Hungary, and that's a separate category. And I would say what Hungary has been doing over the last years has been, um, um, I'll use quite strong words, a systematic sabotage of a common European foreign policy, not only when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but when it, um, in a similar way on, on Syria, on Egypt, on, on Turkey, uh, on, uh, on Russian, uh, Russian actions in, in Ukraine, and even with regard to China, basically uh, on every of these issues, um, undermining um, European positions and uh, um, sort of accommodating to, um, to the different, different powers. And I'm not sure Israel wants to be in that category of, of uh, these countries, which I just mentioned, and also that it wants to be increasingly identified uh, with Orban and Orban's Hungary um, in, the, in the EU. Um, now, moving to the, to the other side, and let me, let me focus on France as, as, a, as a big um, member state. Um, you know, what I just said about Hungary, uh, it's important, but uh, at the end of the day, um, let's be real. The, the reason why the EU is currently going slow on developing any response to the Israeli annexation is not because of Hungary, but it's, it's because of uh, France and Germany. Uh, those are the two main, main countries and, you know, we can, we can pin it down to Macron and Merkel. Um, and uh, very much depends on these two uh, in the end. Uh, and um, uh, sometimes countries like France and others tend to sort of hide behind the fact, you know, point to Hungary or other countries in Central Eastern Europe blocking decisions. But, um, you know, when it comes to Russia, and Natalia Tochi has spoken a lot about that, that parallel, there was also a lot of disagreement with uh, EU sanctions uh, in that case from at least five member states who opposed to them. But because, um, uh, because France, Germany, and UK at the time were very insistent on, on keeping and maintaining these sanctions, they overcame uh, this disagreement. So it goes down really to, to the key capitals at the end of the day. I'll stop here. Thank you for your remarks. I, I want now to uh, hand the floor to Dr. Maya Sion Sidkiyar for her closing remarks. Uh, Maya is the co-president of the Israeli Association for the Study of European Integration. She is also at Mitvim directing our program on Israel-Europe relations and will be one of the organizers of this event. Thank you, Maya, for all that you did uh, for this event to happen. And please, you open your closing remarks. Thank you, Nimrod. Um, and I want to thank all the speakers for your very interesting uh, talks. And what I want to address is uh, three or four uh, points. So to start, try and summarize the, um, the debate. Um, first, from the day that the common foreign and security policy in the EU uh, started to operate in the 1990s, there was already um, large criticism about the capabilities expectation gap. And we see it going on 30 years, um, 40 years from, uh, 30 years from then. Um, and we see it specifically in regards to Israel in the last uh, years. So the EU is much better at rhetorics and much less uh, influential when it comes to action. And we see it very clearly in this case. So the speakers, um, I think, agreed that the consequences of annexation uh, would be minor to Israel in terms of economic consequences. Um, we, I think we should see with regards to political ones and legal ones, uh, how things would evolve. And uh, Martin, thank you for um, putting on the table the long consequence, consequences um, um, for this uh, process, because we do see the Israeli um, status in the EU decreased, um, I think also um, very uh, directly by the uh, actions of the Israeli government. Uh, so it's very much in reactions to, to uh, how the peace process has not been um, um, pushed forward and uh, et cetera. And of course the, the um, differentiation policy by the prime minister of Israel with regards to the EU foreign policy. 
Um, so, so implications would be minor. The world was referenced to Horizon 2020, and there is also the issue of, of timing here. Uh, so timing is, in that sense, in, in relations to Horizon, is maybe not working for the benefit of, of Israel. Uh, but there seems to be, at least um, two months ago, a window of opportunity, so to say, for the government of Israel or for the Prime Minister of Israel to advance annexation when uh, in the U.S. there is uh, uh, the current president and um, under the corona um, crisis. And, and, and this is a question whether this window of opportunity, so to say, is closing down when we see the United States um, um, elections uh, being under a big question mark and, and uh, maybe the Democrats taking over. Uh, so this is something that I think um, the Prime Minister of Israel has to consider very seriously. Um, and if, if an accession doesn't um, take place very quickly, then this window of opportunity is, is about to close. And maybe, um, I think this wasn't mentioned here, but maybe the EU should play for postponing as much as possible this annexation uh, step uh, to, um, um, to be closer to that um, time when this window of opportunity is going to, to close. Um, and there is also other timing issues that we should take uh, into consideration. Uh, the corona crisis was mentioned and its economic implications about Israel, about the EU. Uh, also with regards to political uh, implications, um, uh, there is another timing issue where the German presidency is kicking uh, into uh, action tomorrow. And this actually has a moderating effect on what uh, the camp led by France, for example, would like to advance. So Germany here, um, I think, is about to play, and I think the, the, the um, speakers agree that Germany would play a moderating role rather than uh, pushing for sanctions or any sort of uh, critical measures. Uh, so that's also, um, in that sense, a, a, the window of opportunity for Israel is this um, six months ahead. Um, when, when, if you go back to, to the, and this was also mentioned several times, that the EU has not become a strategic actor. It's not, it has not become yet, we, we don't see the EU becoming a proactive actor in foreign policy, but a reactive one. Uh, and this is definitely a reason for Israel not to take the EU so much seriously, because the EU um, don't put on the table any uh, heavy consequences for, uh, for Israel. Um, so in that sense, the EU plays into the hands of, of Israel. Um, to put the, the issue in a, in a wider perspective, um, we haven't mentioned the linkage policy that have been in place with regards to Israel um, uh, since 2009 by the EU, the decision not to advance um, the relations with Israel as long as the peace process is not uh, being advanced. It, um, uh, certainly, this is also sort of a special uh, treatment that Israel receives from the EU. Um, there was reference to, to the question if there are more carrots for the EU to give to Israel and not only sticks. And uh, we have seen that there are not so many, uh, but the point well taken is that Israel cannot renew, uh, cannot uh, put anything new on the table uh, with its uh, regards to its relations with the EU. So in that sense, when you stand um, where you are, you're actually going backwards. Uh, if we cannot advance the relations with the European Union, with the technology, when digital um, technology is advancing so quickly, uh, so with regards to data and transfer or you know, other issues, um, the time where agreements such as Open Sky uh, was put on the table or Creative Europe, that it was mentioned that Miri Regov was the one actually not agreeing to ratify it, but the EU was willing to go along with uh, Israel and to um, put it in uh, creative Europe. So I think those days are also over, uh, and that is a price that Israel is is paying um, for the time being um, with its policy towards the EU. Um, I think maybe to go back to the timing and to relate it to a more optimal and last point is that when uh, Foreign Minister Ashkenazi began his um, um, his role um, here, uh, quite. Uh, quickly, the, he had a conversation, a phone conversation with um, the Foreign Minister of the EU, with Joseph Borrell, 
And there was an invitation to come to Brussels and to visit um, Brussels. And Ashkenazi was actually uh, answering in the positive, in an affirmative uh, way. And it almost happened in July. Uh, and without the corona, this may have taken place. There was a, a talk about this. Um, obviously, if the uh, government goes along with annexation, um, I believe such a visit would not take place. Um, and no association council would take place either. And there was no association council since July 2012. So this is also something that is very much missing in the Israeli-EU uh, relations, that, that direct political dialogue at the very highest uh, political levels uh, that, that can maybe uh, put the relations on a better, uh, better terms. Um, so um, the only optimistic maybe note that, that we can end is that we'll, uh, we should hope maybe that all those considerations by the Prime Minister uh, would prolong the uh, discussion about annexation further and on and on until this window of opportunity would close and then maybe we would be able to discuss um, a renewal in a positive way of the EU-Israeli relations. Um, so I, I want to thank again the speakers. I want to, to thank you Nimrod uh, from Mitvim. Um, Institute and Mirav uh, from, from the Institute. I want to thank the Naama Barak from the Israeli uh, Association for the Study of European Integration. Um, and Nimrod, if you want to say any other final remarks, then uh, please. Yeah, thank you also to the Friedrich Hebert Foundation for being part of, of this and uh, to all of the speakers. Uh, I think we were speaking about a specific event and how to blog and how to react eventually. Uh, what we aspire for, at least at Mitvim, is to see a more positivist debate about promoting peace rather than blocking annexation, uh, about improving Israel-EU relations rather than about pressures and sanctions. Uh, and I hope that uh, eventually this goal will also be manifested. Uh, thank you to, uh, to all of you, especially thank you to those joining us from the Palestinian territories, whether the West Bank and Gaza Strip, those joining us from other countries in the Middle East. Uh, this type of engagement is important for us as well. Uh, and we'll continue to follow and the information, the analysis, the insights that you shared with us today, I think will be very helpful for us to better understand what Europe is planning and thinking, and that will also be influential for Israeli actors acting within our political, governmental, civil society levels to try and steer things into a better pro-peace direction. So thank you everyone, and I hope to see you next time with us.